It's the nation's favourite antiques experts. Perfect. Sold. Behind the wheel of a classic car. Lovely day for it. And a goal to scar Britain for antiques. Every home should have one of these. The aim to make the biggest profit at auction. But it's no mean feat. <laughs> There'll be worthy winners. Nine fifty. You're gonna make a thousand pounds. And valiant losers. No! Will it be the high road to glory? You make me a big profit. Or a slow road to disaster. Are we stuck? This is the Antiques Road Trip. <laughs> what fun! Today we'll be far out in England's largest national park. Isn't the Lake District absolutely beautiful? It is. How many lakes are there? Well, there's the obvious one, Wintermere. Of course. But you'd hardly expect antiques experts to be able to name all 16. There's Bassenthwaite. Yeah. Loch Lomond. Well, that's not a lake. Not actually in England, either. <laughs> that's Margie Cooper behind the wheel with wingman Tim Medhurst by her side. Those doors keep flapping open. <laughs> Their transport this week is a 1970s Leyland Sherpa camper van. Very low mileage, nice owners. Right, we can make out this hill, Margie. At least. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's get there her into go. third. Oh. 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 Sorry about that. <laughs> Wannabe rally driver Margie is from Cheshire. She's a dealer who specialises in silver but is happy to buy just about anything. It's good, isn't it? Be out of your comfort zone. Whilst Dorset's own Tim, great name, an auctioneer and a dealer, is equally fond of heading off piste. Hello, my name's Timmy. Although his prehensile purchase. I bid. Oh no! Didn't exactly pay off at their first auction. At five. Which could result in a less zoological approach moving forwards. So, forgetting ham puppets, yes. what would you love to find on this leg? I like it. You know, I like a nice bit of furniture, personally. Yeah. Don't you? Well, we could get it in the back. Yeah. Yeah. Make sure those doors are firmly closed, though, eh? <laughs> Margie started out with £200 and has thus far made a bit of an improvement. That is £218.60p. While Tim, who began with the same sum, has a little more, £248.50p. Oh, look, there's some lammies. Are they the first lambs we've seen this year? Oh, look. They're so cute. Yes. Our little lambs kicked off in Cumbria and then headed over the border. Today, they'll be let loose in the lakes before crossing over to the Isle of Man. Can be rough, that crossing. Hope they're not sick. Then it's back to the mainland and a finale in Rochdale. We're going over a cattle grid. Ready? Uh... Strictly Lake District, shop till you drop, starts out in Maryport, just outside the National Park. Famous for its blues festival, where howling Tim Medhurst <laughs> has been dropped off for his first gig of the day at Maryport Collectibles and Antiques. And there's proprietor Ben shuffling his 45s. What will our expert decide is a hit in here, we wonder? Now that is an eye-catching clock, isn't it? And that screams to me the 1930s. I'm imagining a, a big 30s boardroom with a big table, lots of chairs, and people sitting around with cigars. And look at that, it's kind of in the shape of one of the old radios as well, isn't it? Um, but it's really stylish, and I do like clocks. If we turn it over, it's quite interesting, actually, because one, you can use it as a, a mantle clock, which I think is probably its primary purpose. But then also it's got a, a hanger here so you can have it as a wall clock. So it's sort of like it's got dual purpose. Yeah, clock that. <laughs> no price on it, though. Has got some wear and tear, needs a bit of TLC, but I think it's very, very stylish. The straight lines, the timeless, pardon the pun, period of the 1930s, the art deco. So one to think about, but I haven't got much time, so I'd better crack on. Fair enough. Now, whither are Guy's road trip buddy? And does she have the Tims already in a shop getting all the good stuff blues? I reckon Tim's up to no good. Knowing him, he'll sniff something out. <laughs> but I hope he's having a nice day. Quite miss my little friend. Margie's about to get her first buying opportunity in the nearby town of Cockermouth on the edge of the park, birthplace of William Wordsworth at Castle Antiques and Curios. Hi there. 
hand there. Right. Anything going for a sonnet? It's like a box. <laughs> We nothing in it. <laughs> no luck. Two hundred and eighteen pounds sixty pence to spend. Remember, that's proprietor Matt who'll be happy to help. Oh my goodness! That's an old telephonist machine. I always wanted to be a telephonist. I remember having a toy one. I always wanted the ones that pulled out and went into a hole, but this is quite a sophisticated one. Matt, is this a telephonist machine? Yeah, it? it is. Yeah, it's uh, for an exchange yeah. out of a uh, probably a large office or, or, or apartments. So, how much is that? Uh, Seventy we've got on it. Oh, is it? Yeah, mm. never seen one like it really. Yeah. Well, they've got so many interesting things in the shop. I'm going to wander around. A no sale in Cockermouth. How about Maryport, where Tim seems to have decided against the clock? Get it? But where is he? Ah, there he goes. I like this little object for several different reasons. Firstly and foremost, it's a little box, and I do love little boxes. But also, it's quite eye-catching, because in the lid of this box is contained an original little 19th century engraving of a, a couple, but they've been painted as well with watercolours to pick them out. I would say it's maybe French, and it's made of brass on the outside, and then it's completely paper-lined. And normally, with these boxes, they're usually quite tatty, because, of course, this paper over what is about 150 years would deteriorate. And the best thing of all, turn it over, and on the bottom it's got a little inscription, and it's dated 14th of July, 1856. So not only do we know around the period that this was made, which is quite unusual with antiques, but to have an inscription that's been personally written in the 1850s by a Victorian, I find that quite amazing. Now, opening the box up and looking in here, Victorian box, £20. I think that's pretty reasonable for something that is 150-odd years old and it's in that condition. I really like that, so I'm going to take it with me, pop it in my pocket. I will pay for it. I will pay for it. We'll be sure to remind you. <laughs> Anything else take your fancy? Now, that's quite interesting. I love early photography, and this one's caught my eye because it seems like this is the lifespan of a lady here, Mary Stewart, 1807 to 1889. And there's three photographs in here, 1830, 1873, and 1887. But the thing I love about this the most is the first photograph. It's dated 1830 when the lady um, appears to have been 23 years old. But of course, photography wasn't developed then. So instead of actually photographing the person seated, they photographed a portrait miniature that was painted in 1830. And I think that's utterly charming. 1839 is generally accepted as the year when photography was invented. She was born in 1807, and it looks like she passed away in 1889. And I just think it makes it quite a charming sort of snapshot of history. Pardon the pun. Oh, all right. Now, price-wise, look at that. Six whole pounds. So I think I'm gonna buy that. I've got my little box in my pocket. I've got my photographs. I'm happy. In that case, we're all happy. Oh, Ben, hi. Oh, hi, Tim. Hiya. I've had a really good look round and I've found two rather nice things. Um, this little snuff box at £20 and the framed photographs are priced at £6. Fantastic. Now, I know they're not expensive things, but is there any wiggle room if I took the two? Well, I could take a pound off. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Do you know what? Any pound helps at this, this stage. Reduction duly negotiated. Thank you very much, Ben. No problem. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye. With 223 unspent, and while he says, so long, Mary Port, we'll find out if Margie's any closer to a purchase. I've seen a little pendant, a drop pendant in the window. I think it's peridot, I think the green stones. Hopefully it's gold, but I can't see until I get it out of the window. Actually, I think I can get to it. Go on, then. It's a bit small, it's a bit light. Those are peridots, green stones, and a smidgen of a diamond, hopefully. It's all right, it's not bad if it's the right price. Time to talk to Matt. Matt, I've seen this in the window. Mm hmm, yeah. It's marked gold, isn't it? Nine carat. Nine carat. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, how much is that? 28. So, 25 buy it? 25 will buy it. Okay, I'll yeah. have that. Yeah, thank no. you. Lovely. That's one in the bag. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. 
Right, so uh, I'm going to carry on looking. Sure. Because, you know, the thing is, you just got to look. Oh, look at that. You see, you got to look like up. Oh, what's that? Yeah. <laughs> you got to look up everywhere. and you got to look down. <laughs> what is this? That's Fi an old fishing, uh, 1930s fishing bag. It's a, a seat as well. Oh, so you right. You can sit on it. Oh, right. And you pour your tackle inside. So it's a fishing tackle seat? Yeah. Out of her comfort zone. Well, there may be a profit. So what sort of money are things like this? That one's 35. <laughs> oh, my goodness. It's just nice to buy things that are a bit different. I think she may be fishing for a deal. I'm a bit concerned about that. If I said 25 and 25, 50 pounds for the pair, how does that sound? That's a deal. Yeah. Thanks very much. That's all right. Very convivial. But while Margie heads off with £168 left to spend, Tim's taking a bit of a break from treasure-seeking at a former Benedictine priory, close to the Cumbrian coast in the village of St Bees, where he's come to find out about a unique discovery made here over 40 years ago from local historian Chris Robson. Chris, hello. Hello, Hello, Tim. Lovely to meet you. <laughs> Welcome to St Bees Priory. Since the dissolution of the monasteries in the 1530s, the building has become the local parish church. And it was in 1981, in a forgotten corner, that what's become known as St Bees Man was unearthed. So what we're standing on now was once inside. Yes, but now it's just a parking place. And this is where students were practising archaeology. And then when they came here, they found the skeleton of a lady, but on the other side, something very different. It was a body wrapped in lead. And what was expected was sort of green goo and a few bones. And a crowd came round, and then somebody got an electric saw and went round and then opened it like this. Although the identity of the two people was unknown, what was truly astonishing was the condition of the one wrapped in lead incredibly well-preserved, despite its age. How old did they think the body was? Well, this building actually fell down in 1500. So whatever is found here has to be pre-1500. Therefore, you then have a situation where you can open up and see inside somebody pre-1500 where there's liquid blood. Wow. It's strange as that. A post-mortem was able to determine the man's age, about 40, the cause of death, even what he'd had for breakfast. But for many years, the true identity of the St Bees man and woman remained elusive. So the body was buried in a specific way, in lead, which might be because he was high status. So do all the other artefacts point towards who he actually was? Yes, they all add up to a particular pattern. And the key question, can we get a name for the man and the lady? So the original suggestion was, in fact, that the lady was aged 35, but the original dating was wrong. She was much nearer 55 or 65. So that actually there were various clues in this priory which point to the fact that the lady was actually Maud de Lucy. So it becomes fairly clear. We're now talking about Anthony as the man, Maud as the sister. Anthony de Lucy, Lord of Cockermouth and Egremont, travelled to Prussia in 1367 to join the violent colonisation of the neighbouring lands. But when he died almost a year later, his body was enclosed in lead for protection on the long journey home. They went off to Lithuania, where they were attacking the stockade. Three of our men died on the walls. And we've got those three, Anthony de Lucy, John de Moulton, Roger Felbrigg, and it would seem, therefore, that something went badly wrong. I notice alongside all of the other artefacts you've got here, there's some letters. What do they say? It's written by John de Moulton, one of uh, Anthony's party, from London. I leave tomorrow to go to Prussia with my friend Anthony de Lucy. Suddenly, in fact, we know exactly from that letter not only the date, but the place. Sometimes history throws up all sorts of answers which you didn't expect. What do you think is the most important part of the discovery of the St Bees man? I think the story of the, of the man himself, and also a bit like a chemical fluke, 
has in fact preserved him over all these years. And the understanding of how that can happen is of great interest. Meanwhile, the body is now at rest again in the St. Bees churchyard. Now, let's get bang up to date. Well, closer anyway. You know, I really like this car. Well, you can't really call it a car, it's a van, isn't it? Well, I love being high up in any vehicle. And I think lots of people are noticing it and getting a wry smile. Margie and her Sherpa <laughs> are steaming off to their next retail opportunity in the market town of Keswick. Once described by the great Victorian critic John Ruskin as almost too beautiful to live in. There it is. Yeah. Sounds like it might be very suitable for shopping in. Keswick collectibles. Margie still has £168 left, remember? With Mark, the man to do business with. Gosh, that's interesting. Never seen one of those before. Look at this. It's a pen knife, or a little fruit knife, with a watch. All that beautiful enamel. Cartier 1920s. My word. So that must be belong to a lady, mustn't it? But most unusual. It's out of my uh, price bracket because it is £295. But what a lovely thing. And you know what's really nice about it? The enamel isn't damaged in any way. In fact, why would you want the clock in the middle of a pen knife? To cut time? <coughs> Very nice thing. <laughs> that is amazing. £295. Right, this is really sweet. This is a Chinese silver pepper pot. <laughs> uh, they put your pepper in there, like that. And it is in the style of a pagoda. It's got some age to it. It's probably 60, 70 years old. No price, though. I really like these. I'm going to put it in my pocket. I'm very trustworthy. Margie. <laughs> I'm going to have a word with him. Right. Well, isn't that a cute little clock? That's a little French carriage clock. Isn't that sweet? It's actually, it's ticking away. And it's got its key. I'm not sure how old it is. Maybe mid 20th century, maybe a bit earlier. But isn't that nice? I always think miniature things are far more difficult to make than the normal size. So maybe I can do a deal with Mark. Mark, have you got a minute? <laughs> Certainly have. Can you tell me about this sweet little clock? What sort of person? <laughs> We're looking about 100 for the clock. Well, I've seen something else. Go on. That. <laughs> Could I have the two for 100? Yeah. Or is that pushing yeah, no, in? No, 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 that's fine. 35 for the pepper pot and 65 for the clock. 100. With 68 pounds left over. So I'm going to take them and I'm going to go. And thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. See you now. Bye. And now Margie just has to go and pick up her chum. I am still thinking we should um, camp up in this, in this uh, yeah. Egg and cress sandwiches. Yeah. Not much room in the back. There is. <laughs> be a little bit of a squeeze, but... Nighty night. The next day, it's surprising there isn't ice on the lakes. What about this weather? It's wonderful. Is that snow? It is snow. I can't believe that we're in a Leyland Sherpa <laughs> in the snow in the Lake District. Oh, but you are, Tim. And what's more, you have an awful lot to buy today, having so far only acquired a trinket box and some Victorian photographs. A charming snapshot of history. Leaving him with £223 to spend today. Well, Margie plumped for quite a bit more. A gold pendant, a fishing tackle box, a pagoda pepperette and a little carriage clock. Miniature things, far more difficult to make than the normal size. All of which means she has just 68 left in her wallet. Oh, it's really snowing now. We're in uh, Switzerland. Yodelay! <laughs> <laughs> that was really good. Yodelay! You're going to get that. <laughs>
Would you Geneva it? Part two of our lake or break tour of the district starts out in Broughton in Furness. Where Tim gets first dibs. Ooh. Having deposited his companion elsewhere. Bring it on. Still got plenty of cash, of course. So will he play it safe or take a bit of a whisk? <laughs> Well, that's a cute little pooch, isn't it? And I think this is probably a Derby one. And this one, I would say, probably dates to the early 19th century, around the 1830s. And what a survivor. I mean, it has got some damage. There is a chip here. The poor dog's ears are missing. But look at that. That is 200 years old, roughly. And look, the brightly coloured decoration, as fresh as the day it was painted. Only £20 as well. I do absolutely love it. It's a 200-year-old piece of porcelain and quite a rare model as well. But I'll put it back, I'll keep it in my mind and I might come back for that little doggy. Damn boy! Now, what else? Now, if you were a Victorian in the second half of the 19th century and you were a sporty type, you would want one of these. This is quite a rare Victorian lawn tennis press because if you're thinking back to the victorian period you'd have a wooden tennis racket and it would be made of bent wood and you wouldn't want to lean it up somewhere where it'll get damp um, and then the moisture will affect the shape of the racket and it will dry wonky and then it'll affect your game so you would undo all of these bolts these ginormous bolts all the way you'd then open it up like this and then you'd put your rackets in here. And I'd say you'd probably get two or three rackets comfortably in there. And you would do the um, press back up as tightly as possible. Um, and then you could put them away and forget about them until your next match. And I think they're probably quite a rare survivor, really. Ticket price, 75 pounds. I wonder if Margie likes a game of tennis. I feel like maybe if I buy this and made some money in the auction, it would be game, set and match to me. Fighting talk. Umpire Helen will be the person to appeal to eventually. Now, he's a handsome workhorse, isn't he? Look at him proudly standing there, walking along. It's a late 19th century, early 20th century child's toy. And look, it's on its original base with its original little wheels where it would have been pulled along the ground. It's actually made of spelter, which is a cheap metal used in the late 19th century to sort of mass produce objects. Spelter is an alloy of zinc and lead. And that's when um, toys became a little bit more mass produced as well. I do know that the carved wood horses on wheels do sell very well. I'm not sure about a metal one, but it's priced at 70 pounds. Now, I think if we could get it down a little bit, do a bit of negotiating and take that to the auction. I think it will probably melt some hearts and somebody might want to take it home. Come on, let's see what we can do. Giddy up then. Oh, hello, Helen. Hello, oh, Tim. <laughs> I've brought my little friend here. Uh, Good to see. So I've got this press, which is priced at 75, and the horse, which is priced at 70. Do you think there is any possibility we could get to £100 for the two, if I took the two? As it's the two, yes. Thank yes. you very much. Thank you. Two. Right, it's a deal. I'll get my money out. £50 each, then. Helen, it's been a pleasure. Me and my little workhorse are going are to off head to off. work. Yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank <laughs> Bye, you. Bye, Helen. Bye. Toodaloo. Leaving him with 123 for next time. Right, here we go. Whee! Beep, beep. Bye bye. Now, let's catch up with Margie beside the largest natural lake in England. Yes, she's come to the shores of Lake Windermere, close to Ambleside, to find out from fisherman Harvey Lord about a fascinating <laughs> local delicacy. Ah! <laughs> Harvey! Hello, Margie. <laughs> Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. And that is a char. This is an Arctic char, yes, from Windermere. They're slightly different to other char you might catch. They're normally a migratory fish. And in Windermere, they've been landlocked and have evolved differently. It looks a bit like a trout. Yeah, similar family. But you'll find that these are a much superior fish to a trout. Margie. So has the char always been a popular fish? Well, yes. Mm. I mean, in the 17th, 18th centuries, they used to 
ship them around the country down to London yeah. and they used to preserve them in butter. They even made special little pots for the char. A bit like potted shrimp, if you've ever had oh God, love potted them. shrimp. Yeah. Love them. The huge demand took the Windermere char population to the brink. Thanks to the practice of net fishing, which was eventually banned in 1921, to save the fish from extinction. And Harvey is one of a handful of people now using much more traditional methods. So how do you fish for char? Well, there are deep water fish, yeah. so we need to be out in the depths of the lake. Yeah, those poles look very long. Yes, so the reason we have the poles so long is that off each pole, there's a very long line, 80, mm. 90 feet. Mm. And then you may see on the, on the pole, we've got a little bell, which is a Victoriana <laughs> horse bell. <laughs> so the idea is we get a fish yeah. and the, the bell will ring. Oh. See. <laughs> so it's a whole different way of fishing. It is, yes. The tradition of char fishing goes back maybe 900, maybe 1,000 years, maybe longer. It looks like Windermere char numbers have now recovered, but the fish's future is still far from secure. The problem that faces the char now mm. is the pollution. As deep as they go? Yes, yeah, towards the bottom, I suppose. The, the water is probably quite pure, but the lake generally is in danger of uh, yeah. eutrophication with the runoff from all the sewerage and farmers' fields and things like this, chemicals mm, that are coming, coming into in. the lake. And this is what's going to finish the char off rather than us fishing for them and maybe taking one or two char away. Mm. And they used to be in here in tens of thousands, you know, whether they're in that, quite those numbers these days, we're not sure. Time now to take Harvey's catch to nearby Ambleside and discover why the Windermere fish was once so very popular at the restaurant of chef Ryan Blackburn. The potty char is a, an old Cumbrian speciality that is we it? still do here. Mm. And um, we're still doing it in the same method that we've done it 100 years ago. So basically all we're going to do with it is we're going to bake it first uh, yeah. with the butter and it's the butter which is what's going to pot it and seal it in because I always like to cut the fish on the bone because I feel you get the best flavour out of it uh, done that way. Ryan, do you serve it here in your restaurant? Yes, we do, yeah. So now we just want to check that that's cooked. Uh, the best way to do that is to just try and peel the skin away and if the skin peels away nicely yeah. then we know that the fish is, is ready. So for the spices, we're going to use a little bit of the most traditional one, which is mace nice. or nutmeg. We put a little bit of smoked paprika in there as well, and then just for a little pinch of cayenne in, just with a little bit of fire. As we just get this char and break it into pieces and put it into a pot. So what we want to do is get as much of this as in we can, mm. and then so it keeps, what we want to do is pour the butter over the top so it sets and, and seals it in. And what we do with this is we're just going to pop that into the fridge and let it set, and then we'll, uh, we'll try some. Oh, lovely. Ah, the table is set. Mmm, can't wait. <laughs> so, will she go potty for it? <laughs> Mmm, delicious. So what's going on there? So this is our version that we serve in the restaurant, so this is like the modern interpretation of it. Right, so what else have I got on top of this? Uh, a little bit of uh, mayonnaise mm. that's got watercress in it, horseradish, a fennel Oh, flour, that is lovely. And a little bit of trout roe. I mean, that was nice, but this is delicious. Well done, chef. Thank you very much, <laughs> thank you. But while Margie's gone fishing, Tim has been getting on with the bread and butter. Have the bread. Uh, <laughs> you know, the shopping. What amazing views. There's so many sheep everywhere. Do you know what, actually? If antiques don't work out for me, I might just become a shepherd. But I'm not sure I've got the stature for it, though. I think you need to be quite hardy to be a shepherd. I'm a bit more of a weed in tweed. Quite shops, not sheep, in the splendid town of Bowness, further along Lake Windermere. Squeaky brakes, Farmer Tim. That's the place. Our man has one hundred and twenty-three pounds available to spend in antiques on high. Lovely. Oh wow! Look at that. 
That is not what I expected when I opened what looks like rather a plain pine copper or chest. Look at that interior. It's absolutely amazing. Look, it's rosewood and satinwood lined. And you can take all these bits out. There's compartments and it's all beautifully made. This would have been owned by somebody that knew what they were doing with wood. I think that's charming. Look at that. And it's got the man's name up here on a little plaque, George Henry Pohl. A whole Victorian man's livelihood in one box. What's the price? Gulp. You ready? Hold your breath. £600. Step away from the chest. And look who's here. <laughs> They're in this one together. Margie's not quite so well off, though. Just £68 available. This is a nice cabinet. It's a bit dear, though. That's sweet, isn't it? A pin cushion. The rarer the animal, the more expensive it is. You get a lot of pigs, and they're, like, under £100. But they're very collectible. It's silver. It's 1920s. I'd love to buy that. It's 220 quid. <coughs> Loads of pigs. Who needs them? Nice cabinet, but a bit out of my price. Aye, aye. What's he up to? Margie's so gullible. Oh, very funny. Oh, he's having a little doze. Oh! <laughs> Where is he? Boo! <laughs> <laughs> you silly oh, boy. I got you. You're a bit of a joker, Did aren't I get you? you? Oh, she got Did me. I, I thought you, you were good? lying in the bed. Stop messing about, Margie. <laughs> I thought you looked like three cushions. I, I look like two. How dare you? <laughs> Come on, you two. Vince is the man to speak to. When you find anything to buy, that is. That's quite a, an impressive vase. Almost paper thin, listen. That's known as um, Vaseline glass, and it has that sort of appearance of petroleum jelly. But it's a lovely blue colour, isn't it? Very fresh and actually quite modern. It almost looks like a bit of modern art glass, doesn't it? Yeah, but what I love is that great trumpet shape. Super. This dates to around 1880, 1900, that's lasted well over 100 years, in perfect condition. And to be honest, with a little bit of a clean, it would almost look brand spanking new. Price-wise here, we're looking at £45 on the ticket, which for something that survived that long and is of that quality, I think is an actual bargain, isn't it? But will it make more than that in an auction? I've got a sneaky feeling it might well do, because it is a particularly nice piece of Vaseline glass. So I think I'm going to take it with me and see if we can do some negotiation on that one. At last. Vincent, hi. Hello, Tim. Hello. How are you? Nice Very to well, see you. thank you. I have found this rather lovely and fine glass vase. Yes. You've got £45 on it. Yep. Um, can I make you an offer? Go on, then. Do you think £35, would that be all right? Yeah, yeah, that's, is pretty, that all right? that's pretty fair. All done with 88 left over. Thank you, Vincent. All right, take, take care. care, Tim. Cheers. Cheers, thank bye you. Bye-bye. Now, can Margie make her move? Oh, I like this. Isn't this lovely? This is a technique called pietra dura, which means hard stone. And it's the sort of thing that you would bring back when you're on the Grand Tour from Italy. Very popular in Florence during the Renaissance. But I think this is a Derbyshire hard stone. And it's a wonderful technique, look. That, that's, the hard stone is inlaid. How clever is that? And how attractive with the black background. It's £49. And I found a little chip. I get Vince. Vince, have you got a minute? Yeah, certainly, Margie. Or maybe two? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I quite like this. Right, OK, yeah. lovely. But I found a chip in a big chunk out of it. <sighs> Big chunk. <laughs> <laughs> so, it is... 49. 25. Oh, that's fair enough. Thanks, Vince. Is that all right? Yeah, I can't say no okay, to that. OK, terrific. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Vince. £43 left over. And they're off. Right, come on, Margie. <laughs> I've parked up the hill. You would, wouldn't you? I'll give you a race. Go come on. on. <laughs> come on, Margie. Come on. I'm not running up the... Come on. Don't blame you. <laughs> Shut I, please. It's auction viewing day down on St George's Quay at the Lancaster Maritime Museum. And here come our campers. 
We're here. Right, may the battle commence, Margie. <laughs> round two. Ding, ding, ding! <laughs> After shopping all round the Lake District, our pair have now headed south towards the county town of Lancashire, while their purchases have been dispatched to Stroud Auctions in Gloucestershire, where, in the room, on the net and on the phone, auctioneer Stuart Moore will be selling it all. Tim parted with £160 for his five auction lots. The Victorian pull-along horse, great decorative item. No doubt it's never going to be used as a toy again. I can't see anyone pulling it around nowadays. But the collector's market for Victorian toys is always really good. So hopefully should sell very well. Margie spent a bit more, £175, also for five lots. The Chinese Silver Pagoda, a brilliant item. The Asian art market is strong. Combine those two together and we're sure to have some great results with that kind of item. Yo ho ho now, shipmates. Ah. Right, let's sit on our treasure chest. Sitting on the, yeah, treasure chest. Hopefully we can leave Hopefully with these full of cash. Hopefully it's going to be a treasure chest. <laughs> right. right, off we so, go. Using tablets, of course. And starting with Tim's reasonable Victorian photograph collection, bought cheap. Well, there's not much risk here, is there? <laughs> Playing it safe, Margie. <laughs> and £10 opens the bidding. At £10 and the bids with yes. the UIC 12 anywhere. At £10 and the bids on commission looking for 12. Come along. At £10 and we're selling Double money. At £10 if we're all done. At 10 He's doubled his money. <laughs> Spent a fiver, made a fiver. <laughs> Jobs are good. Margie's turn. A tiny French carriage clock. <sighs> I could see this flying away. Do you think so? Right, here we go. It's time. Is it? After time. Time's up. <laughs> £40 starts the bidding, 42, 45, 48. Oh, he's got internet 50, bidding all over the place, hasn't he? 65 and 60. Come on. 65 and 70. Oh, good. At £70, pounds, then it's on commission with me. At £70. Pounds. At £70. Pounds. Margie's also made a fiver after a slightly bigger outlay. His time was up. Margie. Never mind. Tim's trinket box, precisely dated to 1856. I really like this little box. Mm. I think, to be honest, this is probably my favourite thing that I bought. Very sweet. Oh, you're a little romantic, aren't you? <laughs> I can open the bidding straight up at £14. £14 from start to bidding on commission. I thought you said 40 then. At 14, 16 is bid on the net. 16, do I see 18 anymore? Oh, no. At £16 on the bids on the net, do I see 18? At £16, then we're selling to the net at £16. Oh, dear. I would have thought it would have done better. I'm taking a hammering today, Mar <laughs> Margie. <laughs> now for Margie's Pietra Dura candlestick, as found. I would snap your hand off. There's a teeny, minutes. teeny, tiny chip. <clears throat> we won't talk about that. I can open the bidding up at £42. Ah. £42 starts bidding, 45 48, Oh, my goodness. 55. You're giving me a hammering here. <laughs> my bid's out at 60. Oh, that's good. Oh, that's pounds, perfect. At £60, then the bid's on the net, do I see five? We're selling to the net, then at £60. Well played, Margie. Doubled up and more. I couldn't expect better than that. That was really good. Yeah, so I'm really pleased. Mm, very good. Well done. Thank you. Tim again, his tennis racket press. I paid £50. Yeah. Do you think that was a bit punchy? It's a nice bit of mahogany. Hopefully it causes a racket. <laughs> £25 opens the bidding on commission. Do I see eight anywhere? At £25, then the bid is on commission with me looking for eight. At £25, if we're all done at 25 Lordy, I hope he's not feeling too highly strung. <laughs> I took a punt. He did. I lost the game. Oh, game set. That's and... to you. <laughs> <laughs> not quite, Tim. Although the auctioneer was very keen on Margie's Pagoda Pepperette. Isn't it lovely? Really well made in all of the little tiles, Look, all engraved yeah. on it. And I can open the bidding straight up at £30. £30 starts it's bidding. It's not a bad commission. start, 32, is it? 32, 35, 38 and 40. 42, 45, 48 and 50. 55 and 60. Oh. 65 and 70. Oh, my goodness. 75. My commission bid is out. The bid's on the net at £75. It's exceeded its anywhere. expectations. It's £75 and the bid's on the net at £75. We're all done. At £75... A profit that's not to be sneezed at. That's good, isn't it? Very good. Now, can Tim turn things around with his little toy shire horse? Mm, how big is it? Um, 
not full size. Yeah. Sort of this size. <laughs> I didn't think it was full size. <laughs> I can open the bidding at £35. Pounds. 35, 38, and 40 is with me. But 42, 45 is with me. 48 and 50. 55, yeah. 60, 65, 70 now. Ah. My bids are all out at 70 pounds. The bids on the net at 70 pounds. Do I see five anywhere? Come on, keep going a bit more. 70 pounds and the bids on the net at 70 pounds. We're all done at 70. Tim's back. A much needed return to form. I'm happy with that. It yeah. got across the line, didn't it? Margie's turn now. Her fishing tackle comfort zone departure. At 30 pounds, then two bids with me. 32, 35. What's going pounds, on here? <laughs> but £35 pounds then we're selling... <laughs> oh, well done, pounds, you. We're all done. At 35. Margie can do no wrong today. It's profits all the way. What a lucky lady. <laughs> I thought that was the fishiest buy you've ever made. <laughs> Ooh. Tim's last chance now. His turn at the century art class. You're going to do OK with this. Double right. your money. I'm glad you're confident. I am confident. Good. Thirty pounds opens the bidding. At thirty pounds, sixty pounds takes yes. one straight out. At sixty pounds on the net, sixty-five. Yeah. Sixty-five. At sixty-five pounds, then the bids on the That's net. That's a relief. Seventy anywhere. We're selling to the net bidder. At sixty-five pounds. We're all done at sixty-five. Another nice profit, but will it be enough? Oh, well pleased with that. Done. 30 pound profit. Well done. Thank you very much. It's been really nice to meet you. You are. You've been so nice been today. Really nice <laughs> she might be even nicer if the last lot does well. A golden diamond pendant. I could see it making 100 pounds, you know. I could. Well, I'll jump in that boat if I do. No, oh, I'll no, I won't. <laughs> I can open the bidding up at £55. Pounds. £55 pounds starts the bidding. 60. Oh, five, man. 75. 80. Well, it was I a dead set. 80. Do I see five? 85. At £85, pounds, then if we're all done at 85. What a fabulous way to end it. Great work. Well, Margie, I think I can safely say you won that battle. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Tim began with £248.50 and after auction costs made a tiny loss and so he now has £241 and tuppence. While Margie, who started out with £218.60p, made, also after costs, a very nice profit, which means now she's shot into the lead with £310.10. I thought you bought some wonderful things. Oh, thank you. I'm looking forward to seeing what we can buy next. Yeah. Truly Early hunting, days. Hunting for antiques. Definitely. Come on then. Next time on the trip. There's only a hundred quid between us, that's nothing. Maybe you should lend me some money. <laughs> no way. Margie takes a seat. Well, this is lovely. Yeah, oh, look at this. While Tim <laughs> takes the floor. <laughs> <laughs> and drama at the auction. Right, more problems coming up. <laughs>